Okay, I hope everyone's um, uh, back from their break. And, and I want to talk about the use of this Python toolbox for uh, diagnosing and analyzing high resolution model data. Um, the um, people uh, responsible for producing this tool are Jeff Poulton, da David Byrne, Tom Gardner, and Anthony Wise at um, NOC. It, it's not work that I've done myself, and um, but it is to share and it is, um, I think a very useful tool and I will explain a bit about it. Also, I think you should have available to you from the Google Drive some notes about um, how to set this up and then um, run it. I will be doing this in a demo version rather than a, an interactive, you know, follow along with me version um, because it does take a bit of time to set up. Um, you should be able to follow along through the notes and there are various steps that you have to take. And, um, and then you would be able to actually um, do this exercise yourself and you would you actually have, have your hands on some model data. And uh, I would be very happy to answer any questions if you get stuck on it. So if you are going to do the exercise, you need to download um, the little um, guide and also a couple of um, data files that are there as well. So anyway, right. Now, I'm going to, as I say, give um, an overview of this tool. Um, I'm not the developer, so I really, um, I, I don't know an awful lot about the background behind it. Again, we can get answers for you. If you want to use it, and you find you want a bit more detail about uh, what it does. The, the, the motivations behind it are that what you're gonna find if you look at this data is that you've got a lot of numbers. The model output is huge and if you, especially if you wanted to look at hourly data from the model, you would actually be drowning in numbers. And you might also be saving far more data on your computer than you really want to do. Um, so, so that's one reason, it's just the sheer volume of output that you get from models. And another reason is that, um, so this is it, what it actually does is it takes the model and extracts from the model the bits of information that you want and then the rest of it doesn't have to be um, saved any longer. You can throw it away unless you think you're going to want to do the same exercise again uh, very shortly. But if you just want to get some, some numbers out for a few locations or a transect or a map of the surface or um, one of those things, you can do that and you don't have to save the rest of the data. The other reason is that models generally, almost all models are written in Fortran and they are generating um, net CDF output files. This is an efficient way of, sa of saving the model data because the model comes to the header. You can actually always find out what's in that data, even though you've just got a, a lot of numbers, uh, but the, the data file itself has, has some information, metadata in it, which allows you to, to work out exactly how to read that file and, and what data you're going to find in it. Um, but sometimes that's not so obvious how to work with that, those kinds of files. I don't know whether many of you use either um, MATLAB or Python. Uh, a lot of us now, we might have used MATLAB in the past, but we're moving towards using Python because Python is free software that allows you to do a lot of the functionality that we used to do with MATLAB, which would be plotting of data and um, various kinds of statistical analysis, etc. There's a lot of tools available, but they're becoming available as well in Python and Python is free to use. So. It's expensive to use MATLAB, but anybody can download and use Python. Um, the other thing is, to, this is a community code, so it's open and viewable. You can actually look at the code and you can modify it for yourself. Obviously, you're not modding, modifying the original code, but you know you can copy it and, and modify it. And, and hopefully it's clear what has been changed and there's a kind of a, um, a version system whereby you can see changes and so on. And it should be easy to use and versatile for both the user and the contributor and domain independent and avoid reinvention of the wheel, which um, a lot of us in modeling spend a lot of our time downloading data and plotting it. And we're all doing similar things. So where we can share the tools that we use, this is very useful. Now, I realize that a lot of you aren't modelers, aren't going to be using models to that level uh, of um, immersion. But um, what I'm hoping is that this, this tool, at least at some level, is, is accessible and usable by yourselves as well. So uh, that's what I'd like to find out. If I can get some feedback from you, that'd be great. 
Um, the main thing, as I say, it's uh, written in Python and it has um, methods of handling large arrays. Um, it has an object oriented framework. This is good because that means that you can understand when you have an object, it has certain characteristics and you usually have the same type of structure and it's relatively easy to see what's going on. And then it's open source and it means you can, if you want to you become a, a Python programmer, which I am learning to do, um, you can actually see what you're doing and, um, and use it again and then modify it for uh, other applications. And it uses this thing called GitHub, um, which is a way of sharing code and so on, and you can access that. And it comes through this link. Um, so there's some information about how to do that. But what I'm hoping is you only get a little bit of information to get you started and to do something useful with it. And after that, um, it's up to you how much you want to do some uh, further work with, with this. So um, we basically got various um, scientific classes, as they're called, in COAST, and the various activities that you can do. So um, obviously, we're mainly and only at this point in time reading and storing and using um, NEMO data. So it's only for the NEMO model. In, in some future time, it might be able to work with other model outputs. And it takes, um, it could take a transect along a straight line or along an isobath and contour of constant depth, or you could look at the stratification. You could do some, some things like complex empirical orthogonal functions. So you can look at the modes of behavior of an ocean basin, for instance. And it will do some uh, model validation comparing with observations. And there's actually um, an example you can try with altimeter data. And it also can output at a location where you can compare it with the time series from a tide gauge. And there may be other options in the future. So the data set has um, certain dimensions. And now this is obvious. I hope it's obvious. It may not be so obvious if you're not used to handling 3D model, in fact, 4D model data, where it has a horizontal, two horizontal dimensions and a vertical dimension and also a time dimension. And, and then you have various coordinates, obviously. So in general, then the NEMO model we're talking about here is written in latitude and longitude coordinates. So each grid point is at a single latitude or longitude, and then um, the grid is, is divided up in that way. And then we have uh, the names of the variables, which could be sea surface height or currents, east component, north component. And then we have these um, net CDF attributes. So, so um, the definitions like, of things you want to do, file reading, initialization, basic manipulation of the data, analysis, and quick plotting. So first of all, um, you want to um, read um, some data from a file. And the file name, it's not going to be exactly what's written here, but the NEMO file, the, the actual model data file, would be something like NEMO, grid, and T. And .nc is the NetCDF um, file extension. Uh, the, the upper little red box is domain cfg.nc, and that is the, um, the static stuff about the domain itself. Um, and um, the, you, you don't need to read in every time because it's going to stay the same where the grid points are and, and what the time stepping is and things like that. So. Um, that sort of domain information, you can just read once, but the model information, you, you read um, whichever parts of it you want. And again, um, the coordinates and the variables and so on. So if it's a T file, it's this, this one's named grid T, and I'll show you what that means in a moment. Um, it has certain variables in it, which are sea surface height, temperature, and salinity. And then there's other files called U or V or W, and those are the components of the velocity. And they have other things in there as well. So um, this uh, link here um, is, if you, um, when, if you look through these slides again later, if you go to that um, uh, website, this will be where you get the front page of um, Coast. And this is just information about Coast. So you can learn more and you can download it. Two things you can do here. You can either press the left button, the blue button, and learn more. It'll give some information, or you can actually download it. And that means that you press the orange button. Anyway, um, so this is basically, that's that's the basic sort of uh, description of COAST. And like I say, it's uh, meant for high resolution model data and um, with a standardized data structure and written in Python 3. 
etc. And then it uses a GitHub repository, which is used for version control, and, and there's various links there. So I hope that will, you know, if you want to look at it later, um, it be self-explanatory, and if not, please come back to us about it. So now, this is what we're actually going to do, and this is um, the use of the code software on Windows to extract the model data. The reason I put on Windows is that you can run this um, software on Linux, and it was originally intended to be run on Linux. And in fact, the Linux system is where all the model outputs are stored. Um, but I think a lot of people will be using Windows computers. And so this is how you do it if you have got a Windows computer. And this is the exercise I've gone through in the last few weeks um, of getting it running and making a, an environment to run it and, and then actually extracting some data. And, and this is the step-by-step -step instructions, if you like, for the use of Coast on Windows. So the first thing you need is to install Anaconda and Python, at least version 3.7 if you haven't already got it. And um, I think many people might have it on their computers already. If not, you can just go and get them and that's it's free to get and, and install. And then you need to use the Anaconda Navigator to open Anaconda in the console window. Check the versions, and we've got some information about that. If necessary, you update Anaconda and Python and, and check that you've got uh, Spider as well. Spider is a useful environment in which to write and run um, Python code. So that's what I've used. Um, you have to make sure you've got um, these channels added. Um, add channels Conda Forge. And also then you show channels and you make sure that you've got Conda Forge and defaults. I'm just working my way down the left-hand panel here. And by the way, when you look at these commands, there's two minus signs or dashes. It's, you need the two dashes to make the command work. Um, and we need to, yes, as I say, we've got that those, uh, those are there. And then we go um, making an environment file. Um, so what we do is we say conda create, and then we go dash dash name, and then we give it a name, which could be mine is called coast underscore envi, in env, envi, env, 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 coast env. Sorry. Right. So then you, and then you have to put on Python equals 3.7. Then you type conda activate and the name of this file that you just made. So it's getting ready to actually access coast. And then we say conda install minus C conda forge minus C bod C. And then you get coast and then you get also GSW and matplotlib, which are useful um, um, libraries to use as well with it. So then after that, you open the spider app, which is your Python environment, your, your, your um, um, the window where you're going to run Python. And then you type import coast, and it happily does that. And then you import a couple of other libraries, uh, GSW, matplotlib, and Cartopy. Cartopy is one of the things it's used in, in plotting. And um, you check that you've got right versions and so on. After the initial installation, if you've done this once, you just go straight to conda activate coast, etc. whatever your name of your environment file is, and you skip all the rest of it. And to exit, you say conda deactivate, and then exit with double brackets. So, right, that's the basic setting up of getting coast working on your, on your Windows machine. But like I say, it's not a kind of necessarily a quick two minute exercise. Therefore, you might need to go away and do that, and then come back and say, right, I've got coast, now I can do the next step. Um, so, then um, there is actually a demo on the um, Coast system, and you can try and run those um, things, which I, I did, and to make sure that um, they actually, uh, everything does work. And so, you basically go to a particular, the GitHub link, and you download, save, and it unzips some example data, um, to your machine, putting it in a work and working directory somewhere that you remember what it's called. And then you import some data, which so you, you're going to have the data file and then pass to the data file that you need to know. And then having, having these are commands that I should say, you type into your Python window, your spider window. You, you run this command data file equals and you give it um, the name. Wherever the, the, the bits in, um, Angular brackets are, it means you have to put the directory of where you have put your, your files in your, in your machine. 
and and then you do go give it the path and um, to the domain file. Um, so there we are, and it's then you say psi equals that, and then you say psi data set that will give you psi dot data set would show you what's in your in your science data set. You've now got some got some data from Nemo. And then you can import some altimetry data. Um, so that gives you commands again to type in the Python window. And when you've done that, you'll get a, at the bottom, it says altimetry quick plot, and it will actually show you a plot. And it will show you a plot of the UK with some altimetry tracks across it. And, and that's basically the end of the exercise. Now that's just a demo. The information is all there when you go to these links and that's checking that things are, are there and working. Then we want to do our actual exercise. And I'm gonna show you how I do this in a minute, but um, first of all, you need to get some data. I've put some data sets for you on our anonymous FTP site, and you have to connect using that link, which is FTP, et cetera, liveftp, knock.ac.uk, knock, jaw pub, that's me, jaw and pub. So that's all our names are going to be like that. And then you have to, after that, you have to click, you'll see a directory structure and you click on the data directory and then se select a subdirectory, which has got no rivers and download a model output file. I'm gonna show you in a moment on some other screens, um, this way, way, what you'll see when you, when you actually do this. Um, I've sent you on the Google, do Google Drive, um, you've got a Python script, which is called analysis extract model time series carib.py. And that will access the time series data for selected locations. I've already entered these 40 locations. So what it actually does is it produces a time series.nc file, which you can read in Python MATLAB or QGIS or other things that you might use. For instance, if you can convert it to a CSV file and you can import it into Excel. And this is the example plot for the um, data that I've just um, downloaded. And this is from, um, one of these rivers runs. I actually, when I've saved the file, I cut all the front bit off because the front bit is the same on all the file names. So I shortened it to run one. One M means one monthly data. In other words, it's averaged over a month and it runs from 2010-01-01. In other words, 1st of January, 2010 to 2010-12-31, which is the end of December in 2012, in 2010. So you basically get a whole year of monthly data for every grid point in the model. And don't forget that you got, um, so you basically got quite a lot of numbers. Um, in fact, this file, that file alone takes up um, half a gigabyte. So it is quite a large file, but you have to download that. And then you're going to run this Python script, which makes a very small file. All that's in that file then is monthly temperature data for the 40 stations. That's all you've got. And that's a plot of it. And I thought I'd just mention about what that's showing you at the time. So I think it's quite interesting because basically this is uh, the 40 stations which I showed you around the Caribbean. So it's right around the rim of the Caribbean, but they're all showing a somewhat similar pattern. Um, they're obviously not identical. So obviously that's good. We know that you know the model isn't the same everywhere, um, but there is actually a seasonal cycle. You can see very strongly. So if we just take months 0 to 12, that would be obviously 2010. And we've got a maximum of sea surface temperature in the summer and a minimum in the winter, makes sense. Um, there's also a little suggestion of a double peak in some cases. Um, so the peak might be in, um, I would have to check exactly in, in September or a bit later. Um, and then, so you've got five years of data here. So you can see five seasonal cycles and, um, I don't know what else I can really say about it. Oh yes, yes, there was one other thing I was going to say about it, is the amplitude of these, these seasonal patterns seems to be reducing. So actually the maximum, there seems to be a trend of the maximum temperature is reducing over that five years. And I don't know whether you can see that and whether that's um, a really strong signal. There's only five years of data, but it does suggest that there is actually um, a trend. I'm not saying that temperature is going to decrease by no means, but it just happens that over 2010 to 2014, at the stations I pulled out, but that looks like a fairly representative sample. The temperature in the, in the Caribbean is actually reducing slightly over the over those years. Right, so I'm just going to go through. Oh yes, well this is a, this is what you would see if you go to the FTP site and you go to data, no rivers, you will see those files. 
So uh, as I said, I, I was going to point out that each one of them is half a gigabyte. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, half a gigabyte. And I can only fit um, five gigabytes on my FTP uh, site. So there's only there's only uh, a limited amount of, of data that can be there. So um, it's got 2010 through to 2014, and it's got a grid NT, grid T um, file. So it's only the temperature data and it's one month averaged. Um, and there's a readme doc file, which actually you could download. And that, show, that actually has a table of what all the data um, are in the different files. And when you have this on the screen, the bottom bar is showing, do you want to open or save this? And if you click on save, you can save as and put it somewhere in your directory structure so you know where it is. And also pointing out here that there's more model data on Gabby's um, um, FTP website. So um, there's, there's hourly data for 2016 available there. It's a really large file, but it's there um, under particle tracking. So data particle tracking. And if you use those links, you're welcome to download those data. Once you've got them, you don't need to keep going back and getting them again, hopefully. So this is the um, this is the, the spider screen from um, my Windows machine, and this is what you see when you open that and um, you run. You um, actually want to run the this extract file. And there's a couple of things I wanted to point out which have been changed from the original. So you need to make sure you've got your um, the right directories that you want for where the data is and um, this one is, I put it in a, a directory called Carib, no rivers, and it's run five in this case. And that's the domain file that you have to give it as well. You have to know where that is. I put it in the same directory. And then there's a, an output file here, which I'm calling time series 5.nc because I've run, run it each time for each one of the um, yearly files. And this is the fifth one. And there are other places where you have to change some numbers. Um, so I'm going to do that um, by going, oh, I'm going, actually, um, I think I will not go around that, I'll demonstrate that, but because there's, uh, I'm running out of time. So summarizing, we believe that ocean, accessing ocean data is important for understanding ocean and coastal processes, coastal hazards and climate change. And various sources of ocean data exist, which you can access even if you're not able to collect data directly with observational data yourself. Um, but obviously, you can get satellite products and ocean model hindcast forecasts and reanalyses, as well as future projections. And also, you can access some of the in situ observations like Wave Boys from NOAA. And the NEMO model output can be accessed at any lap long location within the model domain using the COAST software. And the va variables available are this. Um, uh, sea surface height, UVW currents, temperature and salinity at hourly, daily, monthly or annual intervals. And I think I need to stop because I need to get let uh, Lucy start speaking on her topic. So I'll stop there, but we can always go through in the break. I can uh, demonstrate um, any of the actual uh, running of these things. So I'll stop now. The thing I'm showing you is where the output files sit on our um, Linux system. And here we've got a directory called CME and then 3D Caribbean Nemo and then output. And in that there's a no rivers long run directory. And so here you're seeing a set of files which um, uh, are per year, 2010, a grid T file, and then a grid U file and a grid V file and a grid W file. So they are the different um, uh, variables in different files. Because it said run one 2010, this is, uh, this is run for 2010. And then this one, the first files you're looking at, I don't know whether you can see my highlight, um, are one day average runs. And then we have one hour average runs. And then we have some one month um, runs, outputs, sorry, same run, it's just the outputs, and then one year outputs. And then we also have five day outputs. Um, but I was just going to show you how much difference in size there are, which means that it's virtually impossible to uh, to work very easily with um, all of the files. So um, if we take the one month T-Grid file that I've shared, that's uh, half a gigabyte. But if we look at some of the V files, and particularly the W file, that is uh, 25 gigabytes. And so it's um, 
really huge. And uh, likewise, if we have, well, that was for hourly data. And then if we have um, um, one day average data for the T, T file, that will still be 16 gigabytes. So like I say, they're whole years in each one. And so they are very big. Another thing I can do is I can use um, host in the Linux directory and actually extract smaller periods of time um, if I wanted to look at a, a, a hurricane, for example. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't need the whole year. I just want to zoom in on the month of October, say, or something like that, and, and, and I could easily do that. Because if you want to look at event scale, you really want to be looking at the, uh, the hourly data. Here's the hourly data files, rather than the one month files. If you're looking at sea surface temperature, one month is really um, adequate to show the evolution of the, of the sea surface temperature. And then you can see that um, we have the same for 2011, which is called run two, et cetera. So then when we go to the, um, this is the Anaconda window. And from that I've started Spider. This was some of the setting up that you have to do in your Anaconda window. Oops, haven't shared it again. Share it first or it doesn't do anything. Uh, share screen. Yeah, so that is my Anaconda window. And I've done various commands which are doing to do with setting up the environment, um, little coast environment uh, script and so on. And so that's there. And I'm now going to stop sharing that one. And the more interesting thing to look at is when you, um, when you go into Spider, which is the Python environment, what you actually see. I just find that one. There we are. Um, so things to point out here are, um, I can't see the top of the screen. There we are. Um, the, the, um, the master directory is here. Uh, JW work Carib Coast Coastmaster. A lot of problems you might have if you're just not in the right directory where everything is. So make sure you are um, where where you want to start from is is in the right directory. And this is the name of the file which is in that directory. It's called Analysis Model Extract Model Time Series Carib.py, and that is being shown in this window here. This is the actual script. It has a lot of headers, a bit of explanation about what's going on, and I'll just show you the things you have to change. If you're going to um, um, change and use it on other data, for example, there's the system path here, which is in this, it appears in this window, coast master, and you have to do importing various um, uh, packages, which gets done automatically. And then it's um, here, there's some things commented out because I've saved um, different file names. So these are the file names for the different input data files. And as I said before, here's the run one, run two, run three, run four, and, and I'm running five because five is now not commented. So this one is, is live and this one is the domain file, which will always be the same. And, um, and then the output five in, file, in this case, it's uh, time series five. So then it runs various um, parts of the script, which is extracting the locations of the latitude and longitude, reading the model data, and finding the nearest neighbors to the, of the model points to the lo locations you've chosen, and then writing time series to file. And then here's the location of the uh, points I've selected. What I've done is I've put them in um, different uh, groupings. So St. Vincent, I've got a set of um, seven, latitudes and longitudes. So this is the longitude first and then the latitude. And then here's uh, for Jamaica, a set of different locations. So each one is a pair. So you have the longitude and then you have the latitude in the next part. So long, lat, hopefully self-explanatory. And, and so I'm setting, I've set up all those locations, which gives you 40 output locations. Um, but if you want to change them, you can change any of them, or you can just make one single latitude longitude location and just run that. It doesn't take very long to run 40, but um, in case you were interested to do, and then I concatenate all of those. So um, it, it's all into one big extract long and extract lat. And um, so that's the, the part you can change. 
and then they have um, the read and write parts and working out which is the nearest neighbor and so on and extract the nearest points and then it goes through it does all this right time series to file etc so if you actually uh, have opened that file in in spider and all you have to do is click on the green button to run it and it will just carry out that procedure and there's some warning messages that don't mean anything so it's okay it's um it says if you're writing a large data set it may take some time but it's done it's completed and so now i can show you where my output file's gone and um it was uh, this is where i started from this coast coast master um file um directory and that's where my time series file has appeared so time series 5.nc is now the output from that run and that basically has got a year of monthly um time points a time series of monthly points um for 40 locations in it and that was the plot that i, I showed you before so please have a go and let me know if it works and if it doesn't just call me back <laughs>